This is the Citizen of Heaven podcast number 118, Reason. I am Hal Hammonds and I am a Citizen of Heaven and your embedded correspondent in Satan's world. Thanks for checking in this week. We revisit Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism this week. Solomon said wisdom excels foolishness as light excels darkness, but he never intended to exclude God with his reason, and that is specifically what objectivists do mean. This week we will discuss the ways reason fails to properly explain the world or our part in it, the things about rationality that Ayn Rand actually got right, the question of whether we actually own our own lives, and how good monopoly players often make for bad Christians. Let's start with what I've been preaching. Reason is what objectivism is all about. It is at the absolute core of Ayn Rand's philosophy. The idea that we as a human race have evolved intellectually, socially, morally even, to the point where we are now is all about making rational, wise, intelligent choices, allowing our mind to guide us in the proper way. That is how we first began to tie rocks to sticks. That's how we harness the power of fire, ultimately the power of the atom. That's how we reached the moon. That's how we built computers and the internet and et cetera, et cetera. Everything that we have is because of the pursuit of reason. And what we need to do as human beings is make all of the choices that we make in a rational and intelligent and informed way, making sure that reason is the guiding principle behind absolutely everything. That may sound pretty good. As far as it goes, I suppose it does sound good. But here's the problem with regard to Christians, and we discussed this a bit last week. Reason in and of itself will not take you to God. You can't put God in a test tube and prove that he exists. There's some problems with that philosophy, though, some very profound problems. The idea of reason as some kind of almost an entity that exists on its own and that we achieve it by simply being intelligent, by pursuing it, by valuing it, would seem to presuppose that everybody who is a rational being, everyone who is intelligent, everyone who values reason is going to get to the same place. And we know that that's not true. We know that lots of people have their ideas about how the world should work. They have what they think to be good ideas. They may agree with you. They may disagree with you. Which one of them is right? Well, the objectivist, of course, is going to say, I'm right. That's egotism run rampant. And the role of egotism in objectivism is, is pretty profound. And Ayn Rand would be the first one to say that. We are right. You need to come around to our way of thinking. It's very easy to think that you can rationalize your way to the truth when you think you already have the truth. In reality, what actually works in the world is subjective, You may think that this is the best policy to enact social change, to enact universal health care or cleaning up the environment, whatever it is that you happen to be looking for. You may be able to rationalize your way to a particular way of doing things. That doesn't mean that every intelligent, rational person is going to agree with you. That is not, in fact, the case. So there has to be some kind of wiggle room there with regard to the limitations of reason. Reason itself is not going to get us to a perfect world. We have to be more broad-minded than that. But let me emphasize also this fundamental downfall of reason. Reason presupposes that we are at the top of the mountain when, in fact, we know that we are not. The objectivists are quick to sing the praises of the souls in the Enlightenment for getting as far as they did, but they didn't get all the way. They didn't rationalize themselves all the way out of God, for instance, which, of course, the modern objectivists have. And therefore, they were good, but they weren't quite good enough. That progression of intelligence is constant. Are we supposed to believe that Ayn Rand reached the top of the mountain and now there's no more learning, that there is no more development, that we're never going to find any kind of information that doesn't improve our way of looking at things, that proves, in fact, that Ms. Rand was wrong about something? Today's reason has always been yesterday's ignorance and tomorrow's ignorance as far as that goes. It wasn't that long ago in human history when we thought the idea of microscopic organisms that would kill people was insane, that we thought you throw a dirty t-shirt into a bin of corn and the t-shirt turns into rats. That was the way the world worked. We knew that to be the case, and when people like Louis Pasteur came around and tried to tell us otherwise, we thought that he was insane. 
And the same thing is going on today. People have the opposite reaction now. If you try to ignore the existence of germs, then you're the crazy person. You're the one who's denying reality, as we now currently define reality. And so therefore, just assuming that we have rationalized our way into a proper understanding of the world is inherently flawed. We can't possibly assume that because we are not done reasoning yet. And at a deeper core than that, even if we were to assume that we've discovered everything that there is to discover, that ought to be an extraordinarily disturbing thing for the objectivists because the most important aspects of our existence here on Earth remain unresolved. I want something beyond that. I want to believe that I am part of some kind of system, some kind of plan. And that's what God tells me. And that's where the element of God really makes a difference in our understanding. Now, because it makes me feel better, that doesn't mean it's a better system. I, I realize that. But when God tells me in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that tells me that I am a deliberate entity put in place here for a specific purpose by a specific intellect. There is a plan for humanity. We're not just some kind of accident. We're not just the most intelligent protoplasm in the world. And I believe personally, through reading the Bible and through examining my own reason, I do have reasoning capacities too, even if I'm not an objectivist, there is every reason to believe in my mind anyway that we are intended to look at the world this way. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, capping off in verse number 11, but really going through the first part of the chapter as well, as Solomon tells us over and over again, there's a time for this and there's a time for that. All these parts of the world have their role, happy times, sad times, angry times, calm times. The way that we maximize our existence here on earth is finding out which one is which. And capping it all off in verse number 11, he has made everything, God has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their hearts without the possibility that mankind will find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. That's the way the NASB 2020 reads here. And that's a profound truth there. We have the capacity to know what our life is, but we also have the capacity to know that this is not all that there is. There's a God-shaped hole in our heart. We inherently, intuitively yearn for something beyond. And when we reach out to God for that missing ingredient, for that missing piece, God is eager to give it to us. Anyway, that's what I've been preaching. This is what I've been reading. If you're getting used to the idea of me using multiple weeks on the same book, I want to apologize a little bit and let you know that is not some kind of new policy. I've been picking some very interesting books that have lent themselves to a variety of discussions, and I have given in to that impulse. It's not a long-term plan. I will plead circumstances a little bit with regard to Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged is more than 1,100 pages long. I think it took me two weeks to read it's uh, it's a heavy, literally heavy lift. And uh, so I will take a couple of weeks to talk about Atlas Shrugged. I've been giving Ayn Rand a pretty hard time last couple of weeks. I want to back off of that a little bit because Ayn Rand says a lot of things in Atlas Shrugged and in general in her other writings and speeches on the topic of reason that I actually agree with almost entirely. We make bad decisions on a regular basis when we make them out of emotion, whether it's positive emotions or negative emotions. God gave us a mind for a reason. He gave us a mind so that we could think our way through things, and to a certain degree at least, to use our reason to find Him. And what I would like to do for a little bit here in this segment is to emphasize Ms. Rand's approach, but point it more towards spiritual things. Regarding the idea of reality, for instance, she's big into accepting reality, accepting the world that exists instead of living in a fantasy world, instead of indulging in escapism for the sake of escapism to get away from reality, embrace reality, accept the reality that you have so that you can deal with it, so you can effectively work in the reality and maybe even change your reality so as to find better circumstances for yourself. I'm all in favor of that. Reality points you to God, as far as I'm concerned. Romans chapter 1 tells us that with regard to the Gentile world, the world that had almost entirely abandoned the true God of creation, 
We read in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 and following, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made so that they are without excuse. They are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. That sounds to me like he is saying that there is a concentrated effort and has been for centuries among people who have chosen to reject God. They saw evidence God has told us in the world around us. And with rational thought, we can look at the Grand Canyon. We can look at the starry sky, whatever it happens to be, and see that there is a creator there. We are without excuse, just as the Gentile world was without excuse. And knowing that, or hopefully at least knowing that, we should be, as Ayn Rand was or claimed to be, committed to truth and to the pursuit of truth. Truth is better than a lie. It always is. Find what is true and commit to that truth. And what better to, truth to start with, by the way, than God's truth? John 17 to 17 and various other passages, of course. Jesus in this great high priestly prayer in John 17 says, Sanctify them in truth. Your word, the Father's word, God's word is truth. Pursue that truth and accept that truth and deal with that truth. I realize that puts you in an uncomfortable situation, perhaps, if you're used to living as the Gentiles that we mentioned before were living. But find the truth. Commit to that truth. Follow your mental processes rather than your emotions. We have this Hollywood mentality in the world today that encourages people to go with their heart. Your heart is always right. Go with the feelings in your heart. Your heart won't steer you wrong. That is insane advice. We know that's not true. How many times have we been wrong? How many times have we wrong because we went with our heart? That's just silly. The Bible tells us that in case you need biblical evidence for that. The heart is desperately deceitful, the text says in Jeremiah 17, verse number 9. Your heart is leading you into sin, into error, into destruction. We know people who followed their heart and wound up in divorce. They wound up in drug addiction. They wound up in whatever kind of disastrous life situation it was because they felt in their heart in that moment that it was the right thing to do. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and verse 13, wisdom is superior to folly just as light is superior to darkness. It's better to live in an intellectual way. It's better to live in a reasoning kind of way. Allow your mind to be trained in God's ways, first of all, so that you know the right information, and then use that information to take you in God's paths, take you in the paths that are right for you. Don't just simply sit by and hope and wish, really is the word for it, that things are going to turn out okay. We have taken to using the word hope as a synonym for wish. The Bible idea of hope is very, very different. I heard Herman Edwards, the college football coach, say one time that a hope without a plan is a wish. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. If you're just wishing that your world comes together, if you're just wishing to go to heaven, if you're just wishing for a happy family life or whatever, what's the point in any of that? Just wishing for something isn't going to make it so. Take control of your world. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 12. Work toward a determined goal that you have used your reason to choose for yourself. You choose the right path, and you pursue that path. As he says earlier in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 3 and following, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus or to the day of Christ Jesus. The idea that God is working in you, and he talks about that in chapter 2 also. This work that you are planning for yourself, that you're engaging for yourself, is God's work in you. He brought you into the gospel. He brought you to the truth. And now, if you will allow him, he will continue that work. You will be able to use your mind to find the right path that God has shown to you in this world. And then with deliberate action, with choices, by using your reason, you're able to pursue that path and find ultimately the eternal home that he has waiting for you in heaven. But it's only going to be found through Jesus. He is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. Find Jesus, pursue Jesus, 
and then live with Jesus. Anyway, that's what I've been reading. This is what I've been hearing. One of the fundamental principles of objectivism is the idea that you have a right to your own life. That's a terrific argument. It's a terrific mission statement, as it were. It is a powerful emotional argument. It's a powerful logical argument at the same time. You don't get those very often. The point of the objectivists is that because your life is your own, you do not owe an obligation to anyone else with your life any more than you choose to obligate yourself. It's not right for someone to force you to do a job, to emotionally blackmail you and do something for anyone else's values, anyone else's principles to be imposed upon you against your will. You have a right to live your own way. Assuming, of course, that you are allowing other people to live their own way also. This is not anarchy, after all. Believe it or not, I have an issue with that. I don't believe that I have a right to my own life. We could debate whether that is the case on an interpersonal level, but I choose to instead look at it from a spiritual level, because that is really where the crux of the argument lies. The reason the objectivist does not see any need to give of himself beyond himself is because he denies the spiritual aspect of life. And the reason that I disagree with him is because I live in the spiritual, because it's all about the spiritual. When you accept what God is, you accept what he has told us about ourselves, about himself, about our cause here on earth, we realize that our life is not our own. We do not have a right to do as we wish with our life. Whether or not we hurt anybody, whether or not we offend anybody, say something offensive or what have you, none of that's relevant. The number of victims is irrelevant. We, as the creatures of God, are obligated, if in no other way, to God himself, because we are his creation. I don't own my life because I didn't create my life. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and of course other passages as well, that we are created in the image of God. He brought us into being And he has a right, if you want to pass out rights, to expect us to behave appropriately. And beyond that, if that were not enough of a rationale, I am not the sustainer of my life either. Now, the objectivists, the atheists can write their sustenance, the air they breathe, the water they drink off to random chance or good circumstances or clean living or whatever it happens to be. But we realize, as Paul told the Athenians on Mars Hill, in Acts chapter 17, verse number 28, that he is the one in whom we live and exist. He is the one who allows us to be here. He is not only the creative power, but the sustaining power. He allows us to continue to live. We accept by faith that God is the one who is holding all the pieces together and always has been ever since the day of creation. Not only that, but we also do not govern our affairs here in this life. We don't get to do whatever we feel like doing. We do not determine the purpose that we choose for ourselves, at least not in the fullest sense of the word. I'm going to refer you to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and before we get into that, I want to preface my remarks by saying I'm aware that Paul is primarily here talking to Christians. He's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ who accept by faith their nature as the creatures of the Creator, those who have been baptized in water into the name of Jesus Christ, and are special spiritual vessels for God. And that's primarily the point that he's getting at. I think there's a point beyond that, though, and we're going to talk about that also. In verse number 19 and 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I would argue in a broader sense, although it's not the main point here, that if the Holy Spirit is given to the people of God, the spirit of life itself in the more broad sense is given to all of us. If Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins and we are partakers of that gift as Christians, conceptually he died for all of us whether we acknowledge him or not. And so therefore Even if you are not literally, spiritually part of the temple of God, you still owe service to your Heavenly Father. If you have not taken upon yourself that act of service, that doesn't mean it is not obligated to you to do so. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 9 and following, For this reason also God highly exalted him that has exalted Christ, 
and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, and so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't believe he's talking here about a judgment scene where everybody has to bow the knee and say, Hail, Lord Jesus, before they get shipped off to hell. I don't think that's the point in Philippians chapter 2. I think the point here is that we are all obligated to him. Whether we acknowledge it or not, every knee must bow, every tongue must confess. That is our obligation as creatures of the Creator. We gladly offer that, of course, as his children. But if you're not the child of God, you owe him that service too. You don't get to opt out of being a Christian. That is not a right that is given to you by God. There is one right that is given, though, and we've been touching on it the entire time. In John chapter 1 and verses 10 and following, he was in the world that is Christ was in the world, the light, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Jesus died for the sins of mankind so that we could have the right or the authority, the ability, the power to become children of God. That is the emphasis that God gives us. That is the right that he is trying to give us. Instead of trying to emphasize the right of your own choosing, the right of your preference, realize what an amazing right it is that God has actually given to you, and then pursue that right, take advantage of that right, embrace that right, become the child of God that you were born to be. Anyway, that's what I've been hearing. This is what I've been playing. Well, some of you are probably just thrilled to death that I talked about a game that you've actually heard of that you might have actually played last week. So let me double down on that a little bit and emphasize a little bit more about Monopoly and how Monopoly affects us as Christians. If you know how to play Monopoly, if you've been there, if you've done that, then you very well may have run into some problems. And by problems, I mean fights, scuffles, family feuds, what have you doesn't have to be that way. I don't want to make it sound like every Monopoly player is a bad person, but you may become a bad person if you embrace some of the principles behind the game of Monopoly. So you can take that for whatever it might be worth with regard to whether you do or do not play the game. But for our purposes, just bear with me for a little bit. Let's talk about how the game works. In the first place, one of the reasons why the game doesn't work One of the reasons why it's so difficult to come to any kind of consensus as to how to play the game is because everybody plays it differently. House rules are kind of the norm with Monopoly more than any other game I know. And by house rules, we mean, yes, I know it in the rule book, it says you do this, but we do this other thing. House rules are fine in and of themselves, but they create conflict. They create chaos because not everybody has the same rules. The reason that you have a rule book is so that you can rely on something that is dispassionate, something that is universal, something that can't be argued against. That principle is even more true with regard to spiritual things. In 1 John chapter 5, in verse 3, we're told there, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Playing God's game in God's way is not an unreasonable thing for God to ask of us. He gives us a rule book. He expects us to follow the rules. And if we love God, if we really enjoy, if we really appreciate being part of this scheme of redemption that he's put together for us, it should not be an unreasonable thing for us to simply do what he has told us to do. There's also a very real consideration with regard to luck that factors into Monopoly. Monopoly is not the worst offender with regard to this, but it is a good example of a game that you can lose and walk away saying, I didn't play badly. I just rolled poorly. I didn't have any control over that. I just, bad things happened to me. One of the decks of cards in the game is called chance, after all. We need to get away from the idea of everything is bad luck, that bad things are happening to me because things just didn't come together. It's not my fault. Partly, of course, because some of it is our fault. A lot of it is our fault, but mostly because we are living under God's Son, and God is blessing us every single day. I love the text in Lamentations, and the book of Lamentations, by the way, earned its name. This is a sad chapter, maybe the saddest chapter in the history of the nation of Israel. And Jeremiah, right in the middle of all of it, he writes, In verse number 22 and following, the Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end, for his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. 
great is your faithfulness. God takes care of his people every single day. Great is your faithfulness. There is always going to be a blessing there. There is always going to be good things for you. And so maybe get away from the whole idea of I had good luck or I had bad luck. Good luck is a blessing from God. That's what it is. Bad luck is an opportunity from God. That's what that is. There's also a tendency among some Christians to get their way simply by insisting on not getting along. This is a monopoly thing. Trading between players is built into the game. That's the way it's supposed to work. The more trading, the better, really, because the more trading you have between players, the quicker you get full color groups, and the quicker you get high rents, the quicker you drive people out of the game, and the game is won. A victor is determined. One way to win, and I'm not necessarily encouraging this, by the way, is to simply not trade. This is a great trade for you. I don't care. I'm not going to trade. And just hold out until the people are so annoyed at you and so fed up, and so tired of playing this game, they will just give you anything to make this thing come together. The idea of just wearing people down with stubbornness and selfishness may or may not be a good strategy in a board game, may or may not be a way to endure yourself to your board game playing friends, but it is a horrible way to conduct yourself among the people of God. Diotrephes was like that in 3 John verses 9 and 10. talks about the one who insists on being first. He excludes everybody who disagrees with him, including apostles, from the fellowship. It's his church. Things are going to be done his way. That's the way it oftentimes works in the church. Sometimes the obnoxious one, he's louder, he's less embarrassed. He gets his way because that's what happens with squeaky wheels. They get the grease. We need to be better than that. We need to not learn that lesson. We need to overcome that by looking at higher things than simply whether or not we got our way in any given point of judgment or opinion. And beyond that even, one of the problems with Monopoly is that the game does not end at the same time for every player. And if you're used to playing Monopoly in similar games, you may be kind of confused at that. You may think that's the way games work. Like Risk, for instance, another game that works the same kind of way. You play until you're done, and then you go and sit in the corner, and you play on your phone, or you watch TV, or whatever, while everybody else continues to play the game. There's something unsettling about that, and rightfully so. It's one of the most reviled game mechanics that there are, player elimination. People don't like being eliminated. It just kind of sounds scary, doesn't it? Player elimination. But what's even worse than player elimination is player near elimination, I'm sitting around with four mortgaged properties and waterworks, but I have not been eliminated yet. I'm sitting around waiting to land on boardwalk so I finally give away all the rest of my money and I'm out of the game. But in the meantime, I'm just hanging in there, no chance of winning whatsoever. And what a lot of times people will do is they won't wait to be eliminated. They'll eliminate themselves. I'm having a bad time. I'm not enjoying this. I'm going to go. We need to be better than that. We need to be the kind of people who will maybe not embrace bad times but who will at least accept that I am a child of God in these times, just like I was in the good times. Like Job says in Job chapter 1, verse 21, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. If we can still hold true to faith and keep our eyes on heaven, we can endure these difficult times and we can prosper in these difficult times and we can draw closer to God and lean on him and allow him to minister to us. And one of these days be delivered from all of this and welcomed into a realm that is much, much better. So play Monopoly, don't play Monopoly. That's your choice. But whether you do or don't, don't let it turn you into a rotten kind of person, the kind of person that people really hate playing Monopoly with. Anyway, that's what I've been playing. You've been listening to the Citizen of Heaven podcast. Thank you for your support. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe through your favorite podcast platform and or on YouTube. Comments, corrections, and suggestions are always welcome. Please feel free to follow me through Facebook, MeWe, Parlor, or Instagram, or check out my webpage, www.halhammonds.com. Until next time, be strong and courageous, fight the good fight of faith, and do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is Hal Hammonds, the Citizen of Heaven, signing off.